Hello and welcome. Today I am joined by David Roach, who is a high performance therapist based out in Ireland. And he works in a multitude of different areas, got a lot of different backgrounds that he's going to talk us through today. So, David, thank you for joining. Thanks so much, Andy. Appreciate the, the chance to have a chat with you. No problem. So where are you where are you speaking from today? So right now I'm in our HQ here uh, in Kilkenny City in Ireland. Um, this is one of our clinics, it's the bigger clinic, I guess. We have another clinic in, in County Waterford and we are just going to start building a brand new clinic actually here in Kilkenny as well, about three or four minutes away from where I am now, which will have um, a high performance unit for education, it'll have a high performance gym, it'll have an outdoor running track, a sprint track and a sandbox for a lot of the um, athletics guys that come and see us, yeah. Oh, brilliant. No, no, well, it's, you've got a very good social media following, so I enjoy watching all of your, your different videos on there, so we can get around to that. But then in terms of you then, so are you from Kilkenny originally? Yeah, I'm from Kilkenny. I'm from Kilkenny originally. I lived here all my life. I'm a bit of a, a home bird, I think. I went to the, I did various courses kind of here, not too far away from Kilkenny down in Carlow Institute down there, where I did different uh, physiology health science courses, and I did certificates in uh, SNC and things down there. And then I went to uh, Salford, which was a massive game breaker for me, obviously, up to do sports rehab over there in Salford. And I spent three, four years over there with great exposure, obviously, with some, a lot of people we know, I think, together um, were there at the time. A really good batch actually came through there, if I'm a bit biased, obviously, but um, very, very good course getting, it was evolving, I think, even today it's evolving. But um, so I'm from just the role, but then myself and my girlfriend, which became my wife, we moved home, uh, had a couple of kids, and the clinic is evolving every single day here. So it's hard to keep a, a track on it, if I'm honest, but yeah. Oh, very good. So in terms of Salford then, for one, how did he get into sports rehab? But then you mentioned that there's quite a few good cohort of people there. Who are the other people yeah. that have been that you're still in touch with, that you studied with? I, I, a lot of people I went to uni with, or maybe a year ahead of us, actually ended up being quite heavily involved in Bazarat. Like, Ollie Carborn's a great guy. Uh, John T is there down the hall now as well. And he's had me down there for some guest lectures, actually, as well. Um, who else was there? I think JD was there. He's working with different various companies in the sports science department in the world as well. And then a couple of people have actually to be from very local to me kind of moved back home as well um, and are kind of working in the field as well. So a really good, a really good um, batch there. Yeah, you know, Steve Aspinall would have taught me himself. He was a legend, obviously. You know, I love Steve. Um, I get people like, you know, Phil Graham, Dr. Phil Graham Smith, obviously, who I talk to regularly enough um, over and do some amazing work in, in Aspatar over there as well. Um, and who else is there? I mean, Matthews uh, is that was there in Salford. I think he's still there, I think, is he? Him and Helen. Um, so a lot, a lot of really yeah, good people. So. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, great. And so what was it about sports rehab and Salford that made you want to do that? Oh, do you know what? I've got to be really honest with you. I'm quite strong willed and, and I'm quite um, driven in a sense that I never really saw myself working on the, the hospital board. I never really saw myself working like, you know, in NHSC or NSH with, with all due respect. Um, I really want to be involved in that kind of really high end sports. I really want to be involved in that kind of um professional environment where you grow and get better and bigger and challenging environment as well you know not that those other areas aren't it's just a different kind of thing so sports rehab to me I felt when I looked at the curriculums of both and a different offers for both um really spoke to me and I knew it would be a passion of mine if I, if I followed it because like everybody when I was a younger guy um you, know, you start something you can drop off easy enough but I just knew that things like sports rehab was, was something that really tweaked my interest in an area that I felt I could contribute um as well as and, and thankfully it, it, is, it kind of went that way as well and, and every degree after and every certificate after I've done has been with that kind of sports rehabilitation in mind um, temptations to do charter physio again after that came and went and, and I ended up doing things like I did a postgrad nearly very quickly in sports and exercise I did my master's in sports medicine after that as well just to give me a better idea on how to work with populations who may not be fit for example who may have things like cancers and diabetes and chronic illnesses for example and that really gave me the, the missing link that I thought I may not have had outside of chartered physio, for example, again. Um, yeah, and then obviously my PhD now is in uh, human performance and sports injuries, uh, which is an interesting thing too. But, you know, I'm always asked the question, Andy, how do I make rehab interesting? And as I mentioned there, all of my degrees are involved in rehab and I still can't make it interesting. <laughs> I find that I find that the best thing I can do with my patients, um, and which I teach and stuff as well, is all about creating an end goal, a credit and a map for them as well to, to go in. And that gives me the best results, and, and the, you know. Right. And then so you wanted to be involved in sport. So did you have a particular vision of what you wanted to do? You, it sounds really exciting with your clinics and practices. But was that yeah. a plan then? 
yeah, it really, like it really was. If I'm honest with you, I, I love football and soccer. We call it over here, and I've always been steeped in that too. And even to the age of, you know, 16, 17, I thought I could play for Liverpool, but I, I just uh, never happened, obviously. But uh, I was massively involved in sport. But weirdly enough, thanks to Salford, thanks to Steve Aspinall, actually, would you believe, my first uh, experience in high performance sport was actually with Sales Sharks rugby. And I would. Rick Porter, who was lead physio there at the time, and I wouldn't have told Rick at the time, but I don't think I even did the rules going out there. But, but one thing I did know, and I had a good grasp on, was human anatomy, movement, and physiology. So these things helped me to find what a player needs to do and how they wanted to get, how I could turn them back to sport with the minimum amount of re-injury risk possible and the highest levels of performance maintained. And that kind of set the fire and let me have it work in that environment. And then I went down and worked, I think, in uh, Athletics Ireland. When I moved home, eventually I worked in another sport I never <laughs> played or don't know much about. And... You know, you have athletes come in and say, hey, Davey, I'm running like, you know, seven minutes uh, per mile, etc. Yeah, this is my pace. I'm like, oh, yeah, interesting. How does that make you feel? How does that work with your body? How are you the day after? What's your flamboyant response like? Um, just trying to put pieces together from there, all the while knowing, Andy, that um, I don't want to be a guy who fakes until they make it. So it really drove me on to study and research and dedicate my time uh, in that area as well. And I think from there, then I eventually got a chance with the with the FEI um, and with various teams, and that led for me being on, on their bank. So a list of physios that they would call upon um, to cover things last minute, pretty much into the lead role that I have today in, in, in that industry. So it's it's been a, it's been a funny thing too. A lot of hard work, a lot of luck. Everyone needs a bit of luck, right? Um, like everything in life. Um, but when you get that break, it's important that you, you grasp it, right? No, definitely. Then, so, so at what point did you, you set the clinic up in 2015? I believe. And it's like, what, yeah. how, how, how much did you work for then? And like, did you have a clear plan again as was what that was going to look like? <laughs> yeah, yes, yes and no. I think our, I think I'm really happy uh, to be honest with you that my clinic seems to have grown organically for me. And that's probably poor business sense. And you learn every single day when it was time to move on and upgrade, I thought so as well. But when I moved home, Andy, if I'm honest with you, and I don't know if I'd give this advice to anybody at the moment but when i moved home it's probably a good advice for somebody who wants to have drive in their life but when i moved home straight away i opened the clinic and i worked probably 10 patients a week um i would have but there's 40 hours in a week and the other hours um i literally studied on site i rented a small room making sure to give me a kick in the backside to make sure i got the rent in every single week i opened up a small little clinical room which is probably half the size of one of my rooms here now and it had a physio bed that was broken it had a crappy little table in the corner it had a press for my stock and had a hand washing uh hand washing kind of apparatus in the corner as well and from there i grew it up to where we are today um you know, that maybe 250, 275 patients a week that will come through in our clinics here in, in Ireland. Um, and organically it grew because there was, a, there was a point, Andy, I think, in my career where, if I'm really honest with you, I was doing 67, 70 patients a week, 30 minute slots, working every hour God sent. Starting to feel that first kind of feeling of burning out a little bit and realizing that my clinic probably wasn't as efficient as it was, as it, as it should be. I was probably giving people discounts for just because I was everything. I was I was the physio, the salesperson, the marketer, the receptionist. I was everything. And I remember sitting down in a room, Andy. Genuinely, I think it was at a Christmas. I remember sitting down in the room and thinking to myself, "Okay, like, what is my idea here? Do I want to make as much money as humanly possible? Because if so, keep doing this, and see how far you get. Because it was profitable. It was." Um, or do I want to read? Do I really want to help people? Do I want to? Do I want to help people? And if so, how do I do that? And I realized then from there on out, if I want to help people as much as I can, I need to help other therapists help people. And that was the first probably flirtation with the high performance mentor program that I do now, but also me trying to maybe work with a group and a team that I can devise that have the same values as me, that has the same drive as me, and for the betterment of our patients, make sure that we get better. We, make, we, we get better every single week. And um, a lot of the stuff I would have done back then, you were kind of, you know, you were kind of living off of early reputation and stuff, and people would come in and they'd have the same, you know, they'd have the same um, complaints about the previous physios. All that guy wants to do is send me appointments, come back next week, come back next week. And that's the old model because it's hard to attract new patients, right? It really is. Um, right. 
like retention is important, but like ethically retention is important. But what we do from there on out, and I've been saying this since 2015, we don't sell appointments here. We sell solutions, <laughs> almost, if that makes sense to you. So it's a solution, it's an outcome, it's a, it's a goal that you set for yourself. And when that goal is reached, then and only then do you figure out that you're you're a complete patient with those two. And what you kind of find, Andy, is as we evolve and as we add different wings to the clinic, that patients will want to come in and, and see us get ready. And then what's next? Can I get fitter? We, we will help them do that through here if they're so pleased. But not for everybody, obviously, but that's, that's the way it works, you know. Uh, it, it just kind of evolved from there, to be honest with you. I mean, we would work with, and I did the whole thing back in the day where you'd kind of have a sponsored athlete, you know, you'd bring in person for free, basically. And I worked with a really good girl who I knew. And she's a lovely, really good athlete. And our goal for her was to get an Irish vest. And um, we managed to get our Irish vest just through S&C and physio every single week. And, you know, I mean, who's not going to be better when they get a free massage and free S&C plans every single week, right? Everyone, this girl has a talent, though, would you believe? And she went to college. And then what happened then was when she went to college, I mean, she would talk to other athletes. And it was always like, Oh, like who 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 do you go to? Where do you go on? All of a sudden, I started to see these people coming from like outside of my county to come and see me, and you know, uh, and, and again, that kind of evolved the whole way up to people coming from America regularly now, NFL players, sprinters, Olympic champions coming to see me and stuff for weeks at a time, and that's how it kind of all started to evolve from there. Yeah, mm, that's 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 really interesting. I think that that I can definitely resonates with me in terms of I've been doing this twelve years, and it's like. Sometimes you're thinking, actually, yeah, what am I trying to do here? Like, what is what what is a success? Because it can be financial, it can be time, it can be status, whatever it is. So when you yeah. were coming up with your, I think it's a really great way. Again, that resonates with us that we sell equipment, but really we want to be helping people with their businesses. So we say solutions as well. Uh, how common do you see that other people do talk about that philosophy of it being a solution-based thing rather than, say, appointments or, or however they want to um however you want to call it do you know what right honestly if i'm really honest with you andy i think i think everybody kind of has and because social media is so big now we're starting to see this thing kind of get out there a little bit people are starting to understand that oh god i need to have a mentor oh god i need to be able to say this this and this and then i'll do what i want in the clinic so we do i think everyone's kind of starting with that idea if that makes sense now but and you know as well as i know when you get into it and you're in business and you're having tough weeks and you're stressed out and people aren't showing up for appointments and people aren't getting the results probably that you that you would like them to get because now everybody's easy work with you know i say to my staff there's a there's a cohort of people say there's a 15 percent of people who will be undyingly uh dedicated to you and always come and almost want more appointments than you want to give them there's a 15 percent of people that who will you would never help like unfortunately you would never help them you know but in the middle there you know there's like there's that 70 percent of people that you will who you can get back on site and that's where you'll make a lot of your best results and the, and the most kind of uh growth shall we say so what we do see is we do see a lot of people under thinking that they understand that but as you know, as well as I know, Andy, like that, it's a lot easier said than it is done, isn't it? Like, so what I'm starting to see now out there is that, oh, I went to see this guy, he was highly recommended, he's a really good social media, and I went there, and all I got was three or four sessions, he didn't put his hands on me, and he sent me a few stretches, and now I'm worse than ever. And it depends, again, on the injury, and I won't go too far into injury, per se, but, you know, if you're, if you're dealing with somebody who's, like, say, a plantofasciitis situation where it's inflammatory response, they're treating the area constantly treat, rubbing out the area not looking at what the information what the root of the information is and that can be problematic too and then you're left with this kind of angered patient who is seven sessions in 400 euro in the hole and you're trying to make magic happen <laughs> quickly and that's difficult as well you know so that's kind of pressure i feel a little bit as well at times and our name probably supersedes us in, in a few areas if i could say that um if, then again if you're dealing with patients and with things like you know achilles tendonitis or patella tendonitis and, and we do understand and we do know that those both those structures love load. The tricky part is, are you interested enough to find out what superseded the load or, or broke their load tolerance and how do you get them back on site? And do you have the skill set, not just your one degree, with all due respect, one one degree that'll give you enough. And that's probably why I've chased so many degrees, Andy, because I know there's a hole there that we're always trying to fill. And, you know, I, I'd be lazy if I didn't want to, you know, I think I may have mentioned to you my why, of why I do this, and maybe on one of our other chats, um, in the past but my why is, is something that drives me every single day um when i was a, when i was a kid i was semi decent at football I, I loved my football um and back in the 80s when i was born a long time ago um there was no real money in our country my family didn't have much money shall we say right but i was playing football and i was getting injured a lot and my mother would you know she would pay for me to go to physio in the weeks and what would happen is and i'll never forget it i'd go in and see a physio and I get the same treatment every single week, Andy. He put me up on the bed, he do this, this, and this. And that's no disrespect to that guy who was maybe 
before his time, shall we say. Um, and I, he would treat me and he would let me off the bench and he would say three words that haunt me for the rest of my life. Three words he would say that haunt me. He would say, go and try it. Or four, go try it, go try it. This was his thing, like, go try it. I was like, okay, I'll go try As a kid, I'm like, go try it, okay. Um, if I walk into a shop and ask for a Mars bar, I do want to go and try and see if the Mars bar's in the packet. I want the Mars bar, right? So the thing is that there was two versions of me that would leave that, um, that would leave that practice, shall we say. I haven't heard the words, go try it. It was one that was like racked with worry for the week. Is my body right? Can I play? Or one that was thinking, oh, I think it should be okay. But when Saturday came and I played, if I broke down, I was distraught because I was promised to go and try it. If I, if I actually, and if I, if I didn't break down, my whole week was a nightmare anyway. So I didn't really enjoy the game myself. And I just feel like we, as a, as a group, and not just chartered, not just sportsmen, not just athletic therapists, not just sports rehabbers. I think we owe our patients a bit more than just go try it. We owe our patients a bit more than just guesswork. We owe our patients just a little bit more than, I'll try this, I'll give an exercise, if it works, great. If it doesn't, next please. That stuff's not going to work, to be honest with you. And if you understand that, you understand that my drive, you understand why I do it and why we have these clinics. And, you know, I wouldn't open another clinic if I didn't think I could have my staff relay that kind of um, relay that situation to. Easier said than done, though, Andy, right? No, definitely. So, yeah, I'll come back to the bit in terms of how you get a team to replicate. Like, you're, I can just see you're genuinely enthusiastic. You genuinely love what you're doing, which really does come across, which is is great. But then when you decided that you thought you wanted to help other clinicians, other therapists in terms of delivering this, what was the plan for that? So, yeah, so literally, I know, and this you might think I'm very full on when I say this to you, but like I would often say, to, and, I, and I tried it, I, I brought in therapists who had a really great CV and I'd say, look, do you know what, Let you go on that. This, this takes a long time to get around to Andy, by the way, <laughs> um, as far as like years of practicing, you know, but I brought my initial idea was, okay, I'll hire really good physios with the best CVs. Unfortunately, the best CV doesn't mean the best people person, you know, and we've had pet therapists come through who are really academically strong, but probably not the best uh, therapist in the room, shall we say. We've had people who are really, really friendly, but not the best academically. And I kind of found my early iteration of the clinic was three or four different rooms, which may as well have been three or four different clinics, realistically, you know. So then my goal was like, okay, I need to kind of problem solve this. How do I problem solve it? So if you want to have a book like mine and the results that I get, you need to kind of talk like me, assess like me, and rehab like me. So then I went about my first iteration of that new thing, which I created what's called uh, the high performance consultation. So basically it's how to take uh, information from people, how to ask the right questions at the right time, even silly things like and simple things like it might sound simple to you, Andy, but like simple things like what does the patient actually want when they come in and see you? Well, the patient wants one of three, wants all of three things basically. They want to know what's wrong with them, they want to know why it's happened to them, and they want to know what the uh, you're going to do about <laughs> pretty much, isn't it? <laughs> Fundamentally. But do you know what? Do you know what's underneath those three things that supersedes these is the why. Is the why have they come and seen you today? Because I'll give you a, a short example without going too far. Um, but I am still trying to play sport. Um, I love this sport, it has been my head and everything else as, as and you're busy. But um we had um I, I was I was limping last Christmas and I had a bit of tendonitis. I was coming down the stairs, maybe we get injured too, yeah. Um I was coming down the stairs, maybe one foot at a time. But John, you know, I was getting by, I was able to train, I was able to this, I was able to that. And then our manager ran me one day and he said, Davey he said that we've three games coming up in the next 10 days. And if we win these three games, we're actually gonna win the league. I was like, wow, okay, that shifts everything. The first thing I did is got off the phone and ran my own clinic <laughs> and look for an appointment in my own clinic. So my why had changed. So if I didn't understand, if I don't understand that when I see me, and I'm the classic, to be honest with you. 30, between 35 and 45 person, a profession who can afford to come and see me, who's interested in their health. There, that's the, that's the classic person I want to work with, shall we say. So I rang straight away in, but my why it fundamentally changed. But if I don't extract that information, and if I do everything else, but we don't extract the information of why, because then it comes back to, okay, Davey, let's get your body ready for these three games. But what happens is it's their close proximity. We can get your body as close as humanly possible to, to 100%. But after that, we're going to have to put up a plan in place for you because you've been neglecting this, this, and this. Listen to you talk to me today. And those are fundamental things that I would design in my conversion consultation. Then I simply went along and I created an early iteration again of what we call injury solutions in the clinic here. So I literally sat in a room, in this exact room, actually, would you believe, um, at night time or at weekends when my staff were gone home and I would write ATFL, grade one, grade two, grade three, bang, bang, bang down, rehab that phase where possible, treatment that phase. And I went from ATFL the whole way up to cervical headaches. And we wrote them out and for the most part it helped. The problem now is, Andy, is that at this point in the you're starting to pick different physios because you're having, you're letting go of their physios and you're bringing in physios. And if they see that you have conversion consultation done for them, 
they see that you have injury solutions done for them and they see that they're getting paid regardless, maybe, just maybe, people can get a little bit complacent. So that, that then has to, you have to make sure people are following your protocols. And it's easy to follow, it's easy to follow protocols when you're on the pulse of the floor. But around this time, Andy, I think I was starting to get involved in international teams and come and lead with a couple of teams and stuff like that. So I was away for 80 days at least of the year. And I need to have some downtime myself as far as holidays and some Christmases and stuff like that as well. So it gets difficult then because then you don't have to pull something you're used to and you might see things drop off from there. It, it's it's difficult in business when you start to grow staff because the job becomes, as in the people in the room, becomes almost automatic if you're lucky enough in that respect. But, and, but you want to provide high performance results too. So I'll often reflect, I start my day of reflection, I finish my day of reflection, and that keeps me in tune for the, for the patients because that's what it's all about realistically. Um, then you have to start looking at things like KPIs. KPIs are a good way for you to understand what's going on in your clinic. A KPI, it can be challenging and it can be Almost, in, I don't know. People it depends on the person's um, depend, depends on the person's um, attitude towards performance because they're all going to tell you in the interviews that it's I'm, I'm a high performer and I want to be the best and I want to learn and everything. But when you're putting numbers in front of people and numbers don't lie, you're looking at things like I'll give you an example. Um, we would re- we would regulate things like when people drop off if they rebook or if they cancel and don't come back. If they don't cancel, there's three types of cancellers, shall we say, right? There's there's a no shore, there's a terms of appointment, there's a person who books in in the room, but then cancels, rings to cancel, and doesn't book back in. And then there's a non-rebooker, or somebody who goes, look, I ring you when I think you're ready, which is completely against what I want, because they're on the session then, okay? So if somebody comes in and they tell you in the session they don't show up, something is wrong with your programming and your planning. You haven't planned the proper session. If somebody's in a room with you and they, they book back in, and they're obviously believing that you're getting some sort of point across, but they're not getting the results. So they need more hands-on training or more um, guided hands-on training for that exact uh, injury. If someone's in a room with you and they tell you, look, I'll ring you, then they own the room, they own the session, which is the biggest problem in physio at the moment. They don't respect us. Patients may not respect us as much as doctors, you know, for example, um, and they would not follow our course of treatment, which is not good enough too. And then you can actually try, you can try to develop and hone your patients with, or your, sorry, your staff with that kind of, um, uh, idea if that makes sense too. So that's in place and that's led us to growing to, as I said, the nearly eight staff here now at the moment, two different clinics and, and the brand new one getting built um, any day now as well. I'm starting. Right. So how does that, in terms of those KPIs, because again, a lot of what you do really resonates with us because we're a, essentially a sales company and like KPIs. And I'm, I, I would like to think you're a high performer, but we you know, KPIs is something which you always got to get. You want to make sure it's right and you've got the right numbers. But how does your team, which maybe clinicians aren't as used to KPIs as, say, people in a commercial company, how 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 do they respond to that, and how do you how do you sort of manage it? So, so for me, and you're right, and you're dead right. I know some therapists who I would have loved to got on well with. Like as soon as their numbers are on the on the desk, they kind of shy away from it. They might go into the HSC or they might go into NHS, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so you really have to get your plan and your mission across. And my mission, as I explained to you, and I hope I got across as passion as I would like to be about it. Um, it's difficult. I was working 17 days straight. Now I'm, I'm probably struggling a little bit today. Um, but I suppose you really have to get your point and your mission across and involve people and understand. And I think we have to, as therapists, get the feel of a room with emotional intelligence. Maybe you need to pander to somebody who's a high performer who likes results, pander to that. People who like res- uh, um, solutions, pander to that. But also, you need to make them understand that this isn't a them thing, it's an us thing. It's it's not about the numbers aren't about you, it's about us as a team and how can I help you become more successful. I also am very big on what I do every single week, Andy, here is we, we shut the clinic down on, a, on a Thursday from half 12 to 2 o'clock and we do training. I teach just staff all the powerpoints that i do and my mentor that i do as well the high performance institute i teach the staff all we have good we have good and forward-thinking professional business meetings around what can we do better how can we have better equipment how can we have better kit everything we do as well and every single staff member of mine has a half an hour slot with me every single week to actually talk about what's good what's bad or any pressing issues that they need to speak about too and when you're in those situations with them and you provide all of that then they kind of get on they see that you're actually legit and what you want to do and the great thing about all of that Andy, is that when you do have to have a meeting with them and their numbers aren't right. You can explain to them why they're not right, give them a solution. If they're not a fit, then two things happen. They will either improve the numbers or they will leave. Both things you don't mind because that's the numbers are the patients, because the patients are the numbers, let's be honest. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, that that's yeah, that really completely resonates that that philosophy. And it's like it is sharing the mission because it's not about someone being good or bad, it's about whether they either they fit with what you're looking for and whether you fit with them and all of those things. But I'm a 
Matt's a really real big believer in the mission and making sure that it's the team, everything that we're doing, we're doing it together. We've all got our own accountability, which is a massive piece, which is where the KPIs come in. So I know that that really does resonate. And, and so how would you see that? Like how, how different you, the way that you do it, do you feel from what you've seen in other environments? Um, I'm probably, um, I'm, uh, yeah, I suppose I, I like to back my passion with, I like research. I do like my research, say, but I think I, I this may speak to you, Andy, as well, a little bit too. I often see people putting up online, oh, we are a research driven or um, practice, or we are like an evidence based practice. With all due respect, and I hope it doesn't irk anybody out here now at the moment here, but like I sometimes find that when we talk about research driven practice, it lacks that one thing which is called experience. Like experience, research is great to back you, shall we say, and give you an understanding about experience. We're treating, and we always say, and I see, I often see patients, I often see therapists online, and they have underneath their tagline is evidence-based practice, and then literally underneath it then is written something like this: patient solution format. But they're two different things because if you're going to go with experience, that's good. That that's trying to identify that we're all the same. We're not all the same. We're not all the same. It's your problem-solving ability. So my, I think, my experience in problem-solving and my ability to create passion in a room and a, and a programming goal with patients are what sets me apart. I feel if you're to ask me if you're if you're to really pin me for that, that's how I do it differently in this area. If I'm honest with you, I do see a lot of guys again, like, like I said, yeah. There's tr there's three main areas I would see online. There's results, there's social media, and then there's the person's academic background. We all have a very similar academic background because it's, it's, it's Bachelor of Science. Whether it's chartered, whether it's like therapy, or sports rehab, it's a level eight. We have a good social media now. The one thing that's very hard to get is results. And you, you can blag two of these almost a certain degree, my friend, but the results are where it speaks out. That's where we're so big on our social medias because we just get out there. I don't know, Andy, I'll ask you a question then, shall I? We are very, we're very, um, I won't say brash because we don't want anyone to feel bad about our results. We don't shame, we don't think that. But we're very vocal about our results here. How do you feel like that sits into what you've seen, do you think, then, in the, in the current climate of physios? In terms of what with your results uh, outwardly on social media and so on, you mean? Yeah. Um, well, I think, and I've had this conversation with a couple of different people. I think everything is changing now. Like private healthcare is overtaking public health, and so I know I, I sort of got similarities to that. So I think if you're not letting people know, and I saw this with Arnold Schwarzenegger talked about this, was where he said if you're not letting people know what you do and what the outcomes of other people have been as long as what you're saying is true then it's like you've got to let people know it and it's I, I, i'm i like we've uh, we're not brash as a sales company to some extent which i'm not saying is a good thing i'm saying it's you've got to get that balance right between giving factual information yeah and just also you've got to tell people what you're doing what you're doing what the outcomes have been because if you don't like you're doing people a disservice like you're there to to help people so I think the more people, yeah. the people have got to make their own choices. And if they don't know what the choices are, then, yeah. you know, it's not helping anyone. No, you're 100%. You're actually, I'm glad to hear you say that because you're 100% you're right there. We have to, like, and what, the reason we look for, like, we, I'm delighted that we have, I think it's 100 and something, 20 something reviews on Google. We have 200 and something on Facebook, say. But the reason we ask for these, and when I say a brash, I don't mean we're out there shouting about our results. We just put up a lot of stuff about our patients doing really, really well. But like the reason that we like reviews is because it lets other people see who might be sitting. So not everybody's as savvy, you know, and understands injury. But when we have a review of back pain that was going on for two years and we fixed it in four sessions, shall we say, or whatever it is, it might help somebody else see that, that let them know there's help out there and that we're the person to help. Because I, I, I'll, be I'll be very honest, Andy, with you. I, I would never want to come across to be the clinic that fixes everything because that's impossible, right? You know that. But what we strive for here, Andy, in my clinic with my staff is that anything that's Anyway, achievable to be fixed, we will get that done, job done. And that's why we teach our staff all these things too. And that's why what happened then, I think, after that, when I really got our staff in line and we're expanding, expanding, I had a lot of different physicians who come for like placements and stuff, and they'd ask me to be their mentor. And I wasn't in a position to mentor them back then because it was too busy. But I started like webinars and I started doing things like, and then COVID came along, which helped me a little bit, I think, get the webinars out there. We have a catalog of webinars now, things like Flexi Learn, which is a pyramid system about assessments and social media and all that stuff, and things like master classes. But it then that's when, and I hope it don't sound silly, the old me would hate me saying this, I think, but like, I, I really think at one point there, I was trying to maybe mind my information for myself but i've realized now since that that sharing information is, is the best and most organic way to feel good about yourself you lose all these things like 
all these kind of restraints that you have on yourself and imposter syndrome and all these things when you start to share and really back what you believe around helping people in, in the healthcare in the healthcare sectors, you know. So um, that's why I was interested to chat to you and I love, I love the stuff that you guys are doing there as well. And you're very mission based and very solution based too. So that's the reason why we're, we're chatting, I think. Yeah, well, no, so going into that then, so how do you, when, when you're trying to share that out to people, there's obviously there's Google reviews, you've got a big social media following. Is that, do you actively look to do that? Or is that something that has happened organically with, say, the social media development? Yeah, our, our, so our social media, and again, I'm like just 40, so I don't know if I'm as, as savvy with social media as I should be, but our social media kind of exploded at different points. It was like when I started first, it was all local and then like into different counties and then Irish and everything else. And I think every time an athlete has come over, like a really good one, say, Curtis Mitchell, Irish, or sorry, American Adidas sprinter, medalist, uh, the World Championships, when he came over, like, people like you saying both started looking at our stuff people like um uh what's the guy's name the american guy justin gatlin started looking at our stuff coleman started looking at our stuff and all of a sudden then we went from having two and a half thousand people following us to four and a half thousand people following us when Brittany reese came over who's the olympic medalist and world championship record holder phenomenal american lady she comes to me for her hip and stuff like that when she came over to me another three thousand came onto the back when devon came another two and a half thousand so organically has kind of grown the weird thing is with these social medias and you can probably testify to this as well when it's a practice or it's medical we don't probably get the amount of like say likes and comments on it that we would because a lot of other therapists would look at it and not like it and say but the uh, the analytics will show us that we have a lot of interaction with our page like twelve thousand people a day are looking at it and things like that or more even i think at times um depending on the post i think as well but i think looking back on that side of things the, the social media aspect of things is probably bigger than i even bit know myself to be honest with you it's, it's a massive thing you know I think it's interesting with that because again, it's like I've I, I did the, I started doing these completely just because I was in, I'm always interested in people and so yeah. on. And we you know we'll, we'll get we'll get some interaction, which is great. But it's like I do get a lot of people coming over saying, "Oh, I've seen your podcast. That's really cool." See, so, you know, the, the, they don't necessarily interact, so I can empathise with you. Is that the people mm-hmm. people do see what you're putting out there, and mm-hmm. it may not always show up in tangible things. But it's putting out good quality stuff, then people tend to, they notice it. Yeah, and I think you're right. And I think that's that, just to lead back to your question again, that kind of led me to, because what was happening was I was starting to, to do the social media thing around the helping other therapists put that information out there. But what I found then was, Andy, would you believe, and I'm sure you understand this as well, is I've, I would go from not putting up as much patient orientation solution stuff anymore. And it was like training physios and training different people. And I definitely felt like we had a weird fluctuation in our numbers and people maybe not, like not as many new patients booking in because we weren't speaking to the patients anymore. That's probably why I started the High Performance Page Institute page on social media, and that's kind of built up now. I think around maybe 1,700 on that now, or something at the moment. With I think we follow up a few back. Just I'm interested. I'm like you. I'm interested in other therapists, and I would chat daily on that with people, just about small things, anything big things, small things help. But I suppose one of the reasons why I I, I stopped it as well is that sometimes, Andy, with all due respect as well to people that people will come on and you'll you'll see an exercise on our page or you'll see something on our page. And then it's been replicated with no context on another page. And it's just like a probably not helping the injury they're looking at as well. So then I felt like I needed to protect people from that as well. That makes sense to you. And that's why I started the firewall a little bit of on the paywall between different courses. If you're really interested in learning my ways, you'll have to come onto these courses and spend time like I've done. I spent a lot of money in my education, as you can imagine. I spent a lot of time in personal finances on get to where i am today and not that i want to make sure everyone has to pay for it but again we also make a living and the more money we invest in this the better product i can actually provide in the clinic and online as well so then we started the page there we do interact and we did create these kind of powerpoints on zoom and we create these webinars some of them free there's a lot of free stuff on there as well from honest with you the most recent one i still think is tagged in our um, bio on the high performance issue and it's all about the high performance therapist how to be you want the simple stuff but the intricacies of it and the, the knowledge that I would use is kind of in mind that pay wall, I think, a little bit as well. I feel like that's just the way to go with it, you know? Yeah, yeah, well, definitely in terms of like the the money side of things, you're there, everyone is there to provide solutions and it's up to the client, whether it's a physio patient in your case, if they choose to do it or not. So it's like you're just giving them solutions and you are picking the ones that you think will be best for them, obviously, but ultimately yeah. it's up to them if they, they want to pay for it or not, is the way I see all those things. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, no, and then again, it's just, 
we do we, we're very very on the button with our with our with our with our therapist or sorry with our patients should we say in clinic we do provide that little bit extra I and mean, i would even provide things like extra like s and c plans after they finish for free i would provide because we already have a, with a bank of them done up it costs us nothing anymore and our, our tech that i use to distribute these will keep an eye on them and how many times they've logged in in a month and stuff like that then i can hammer them when they come and see me again like, why aren't you logging out your stuff and you want to stay injury free i thought our goal was this this and this and now you're now that's gonna be another like, five six sessions see you here now and whose fault is this realistic people it's creating complete accountability and as far as the, the paywall is concerned with like with our therapists, I suppose I really want to make sure that we're working with therapists who have the patient's best interest at heart as well. You know, because I do feel like it could probably skew some of these skill sets to, 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 to unethically, maybe if I can be so rash, um, appointments out patients as well. And that doesn't really sit well with me, you know. So I want to make sure mm. we're working with the right people. And I'm lucky I'm in a position in my career now to work with people who I really want to work with. Yeah, no, it's all about people. That's the more, the more I go on, the more it's like, not only because you want to do a good job, but just because it's more enjoyable, isn't it? If you're not working with people that you want to be with, it's yeah, it's, it's no no fun at all. And then so marrying all of that things up, then so you've been running your business now for for quite a long time. How do you how do you balance and that? How did you learn how to run a business? Again, I wish I could say that I was born a leader and I was born a businessman, but like I've made every mistake, Andy. Like, you know, I have, like, I've made every single mistake that you can make. And I, but the difference is I learned from it. Like, the difference is that, like, I, I know that I couldn't keep going on making those small mistakes and still provide a really good service to my patients. And that's my why, again, my why is what gets me out of bed every morning and understanding uh, where I need to learn. And come here, look, I've done little kind of um, business um, and social media little kind of courses and I mean I'm talking about low level stuff just to give me an idea and a flavor of what I want to do so and then I suppose you know fool me once shame on me and all that as that saying goes but I think I think the what's made me into the, into the business man I am today is that my mission and my goal has never really deviated or changed from that day I sat in that previous clinic sitting down and understanding what I want to do what I want to achieve and literally I'm a real I'm a real drawer like I'm not good at <laughs> but like I would literally sit down and map things out put spoke in place and take things off and that's just how I am you know unfortunately for me and if like uh, when I was studying in uni and stuff like that I remember <laughs> I don't know I'd tell you this but in, in uni what I would do is I would read a page I would write the page and I would read the page again and if I didn't know it I'd write it once more I'm just really like pedantic about these kind of things too and I feel like that's what's got me too but got me to where I am as well but that that does get easier and if you're really interested, Andy, this all comes back to every single time, my friend, is that if you're very interested, you're really interested in the end goal you've deciphered, you'll make that work. You'll make that happen too as well. And am I sitting here today in front of you being the best businessman in the world? No, definitely not. There's no business modules in my degrees, unfortunately. And I wish there was maybe now looking back, but and I'm sure I'm going to make more mistakes. But as long as we're uh, looking after our patients, they're going to keep coming back. The one piece of advice I could give you and all the guys out there is it's simple when you're, it's for me, the way I simply break it down and I kind of abide by this as well. I look after my therapist, my therapist look after my, my, my I look after my therapist, my therapist look after the patients, the patients look after the business. And that kind of thing comes around and around and around. And that kind of, you have to, that's the way I do it these days. Yeah, that's quite nice. I've not heard that before. That's a, that's a good one. I might, I might borrow that one. <laughs> Grabs pen. <laughs> No, you're I'm dead right, Andy. It. It's fine. I yeah, love it. You're dead. <laughs> you're dead right. I mean, obviously, you're dead right. You're very similar in a lot of ways to me, so I hope that helps. No, no, I think that, that that really does resonate. And so when you're mapping things out, then, what is the, the vision for you, then? Yeah, so the realistically, uh, you know, I, uh, wow, I'll go, I'll, I'll go deep. Um, like, realistically, we want to provide the highest service possible in our field to provide. I want to create an environment where the best outcomes aren't just possible, but they're inevitable. That's what I want to have in this area. Okay, so I'm going to work towards that. Everything, which is, and you'll notice once I haven't said there, I, I want to be the best clinic in the country. The best clinic in the country is an, a nominal term. Do what you can do to the best of your standards over and over again. And that's going to be a sustainable business. That's going to be uh, something that's worth working in. It's unfortunately, without, it's not very sexy, but it is a project. We, we work in a project and the benefits are for our patients in that respect too. And also our staff would be earn a good living out of it and provide a future for them as well and it's a project realistically so the outcome for me is i want to really be i want to be i want to continue to get the results that we do i want to make sure we have an environment for people that would help them get better where possible at all and just and just bridge it bridge into that and see see where we go i guess in the next how, how that's going to suit me will i open multiple branches 
I'm not entirely sure. People are in Dublin are asking me to go up and take a room in Dublin or open in a different gym down here. And I kind of have two clinics now, and uh, I, I don't really see it unless I could. You know, it's difficult because I want my standard. I don't want to bring. I don't want to open a clinic in another county. I want to bring our brand of healthcare further. And we're very lucky, as I said to you, daily here, and the people are coming from massive distance to see here to see me like every single day. So they're still coming to me, and that probably may not change for a while more. I don't know. I don't. I don't know. We'll have to see. Yeah, yeah, no, that sounds good. And then for your own development, then you've we've talked a lot around non-clinical stuff, which I always like those ones as well. Do you do uh, are there any of the books or professional development things that you listen to or watch to keep yourself sort of in this zone? Yeah, Atomic Habits is a book I've read a couple of times. Obviously, that's quite good because habit is a thing that can get lost when you have so much stuff on. Um, I actually read. I don't know if I'd recommend it. Do you ever do you know Grant Cardone? No, Grant. Yeah, yeah. A big businessman, obviously, but the two business seats in my field, 10x, but yeah, two business seats for physios if you're going to waste some time and money. Maybe you, maybe businesses like, you know, that aren't in the patient treatment room, I probably took, actually, you know, I probably took a lot out of that maybe in other aspects rather than the physio side of things. Um, who else? God, there is more. Rich Dad, Poor Dad, there, that one. Yeah. Everyone, that's some, good. Of the most, some of the most classic ones. And then who is the most recent guy? Sorry, because there is there is um, a guy, and I think I think you'll know it as well. Um, my library here, my audiobooks. Diary of a CEO is quite good. Yeah, yeah, no, he's yeah. I've got. I'm actually, where I'm reading that currently is uh, the fifty. Is it fifty laws? Isn't it? I think the fifty or thirty laws, which yeah. are whatever it is. That's good. Yeah. There's, There's a lot of it, isn't there, at the moment? There is right. There is. And then, did you ever hear a book called The Four Hour Week? Did you ever hear that? The four hour work week. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, Tim Ferriss. That is a really good one. That is. Yeah. yeah. Do you know that's, what I find, Andy? That's kind of challenging me a little bit too, because there's a small side of me, and I'm sure you understand. I'm sure all the therapists that are listening to this will understand too. So there's a small side of me that knows I should probably do less in my clinic patient ways, and I should work more on my business. That book is challenging me at the moment to actually let go of that. Not let go of that. I don't want to let go of the therapist side thing just yet. But I, it's challenging me in a good way. It's making me think. And I like to reflect. I like to start my day with reflection and finish, like I said. It's challenging me to maybe just take a step back. And if I look at my, maybe it's a bit of therapy here for me now, but if I look at my work week and the patients, when the patient that we treat, I only treat around 33 now, I think, roughly. That's about 20% less, uh, less of our caseload. So I'm treating 20% of the people that come into my business. It's probably not great. It's probably not great, is it? I need to do, maybe do, I need, I need to influence more. Well, you know, it's, it, there's no perfect solution on anything, is there? Like you're always just trying to do the best you can, and it's, yeah, it's, yeah. If you if you if you get everything perfect, then let me know because it's, it's definitely it's, it's not it's not easy to work it out. You'll be looking at a liar then, my friend. So yeah, <laughs> no, exactly. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, look, brilliant. I really enjoyed chatting to you, as I always do. Really appreciate you sharing your insights on things. I think it's great what you're doing with all of your, both your, um, that the social media presence, but you're doing loads of other things outside of the clinic and the training course, which I know are really popular. So I appreciate that. Good luck with everything for the rest of the year. I'm coming over in January, so I'll be good to come and catch oh, up yeah. and uh, check your facility out. And Please. yeah, Absolutely. talk some more books. Sounds good to me. Yeah, we're getting a little book club going, Andy, shall we? Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Love it. Brilliant. Cheers, David. Appreciate Andy, that. Thank up. you.